systems. Um, and I'm going to show you some really preliminary applications to um, comparative planetology. This is a really a new study that we've been conducting um, just in the past couple months. Up until you know yesterday, we're actually still doing some of the analysis. So this is really new stuff. Um, so I'm going to start with just giving a quick intro to networks, which Bob just gave most of you. Uh, and then I'm going to go into some more detail about some of the metrics, the statistical metrics that we can use to quantify the relationships uh, that we see in these networks. Uh, and then I'm going to show uh, some preliminary applications to uh, planetary materials, specifically Mars, uh, Moon, and Vesta. <clears throat> so to start, Mineral, uh, networks are made up of nodes and links. In our case, uh, networks uh, nodes are representing minerals. So each individual mineral species is represented by a node. And the links between them represent uh, the coexistence of two mineral species. These come together to comprise a network. Um, we can make a network uh, based on an element. So we could show uh, you know, the carbon mineral network. We could show uh, a network based on deposit type, a rock type. Um, or even a planet. If you want to use, say, Martian meteorites as a proxy for you know, the bulk Martian material, um, we can look at it on a planetary scale. A big assumption, I know. Um, great, so now to talk about these uh, metrics, uh, there are two different types of metrics. Uh, the first is local, and that applies to an individual node in the network. Uh, this can help answer questions like, how important is this one node? And does one node communicate between uh, two distinct groups? Is a node a broker in between uh, two different systems? Um, and then there's global, uh, which is looking at the entire network, which is what more so what I'm going to focus on in this talk. Um, and so with that, we're answering questions like, is this network highly interconnected? Um, and does the network form distinct clusters or groupings? So for the local metrics, I'm just going to touch on just a few, just three here. Um, degree centrality. First, this is the number of links that are connected to a given node. So essentially the number of nodes that a node is connected to. Pretty simple. Uh, and then we have node diameter. So this is the longest geodesic path uh, to any other node. Essentially it's the longest, shortest distance or degrees of separation to another node. And uh, between us, centrality is similar, but it's a measure of the number of shortest paths that pass through a given node. So I mentioned that term broker. Um, if it has a very high between us centrality, it means a lot of minerals are connected, a lot of nodes are connected through this individual node. So next, the global measures. Um, I'm just going to talk about four here. There are a lot more, but we're just going to focus on four. Uh, first is the density. And that is essentially the number of links divided by the number of possible links. So it's the interconnectedness of a network. This is interesting in mineralogy because the more interconnected a network is, the more likely we're dealing with an equilibrium mineral assemblage. Um, so you can see here as density increases, everything is more connected to each other. Uh, network diameter, similar to the diameter explained before, uh, it's the largest geodesic distance in a network. So it's essentially the shortest path uh, between the two most separated nodes in a network. And the average is exactly what it sounds. Um, it's the average degree of separation in a network, which is a term we're probably all familiar with, um, degrees of separation. Uh, lastly, I mentioned centrality, which is a, a measure you can use for an individual node to understand its importance. But you can look at centralization to understand uh, the centrality of an entire network. Uh, so for centralization, it's a measure of how central a network's most central node is relative to how central the other nodes are. So we're looking to examine are there a few very important nodes or are the connections really interspersed throughout the network. Um, this is true of degree centralization and between the centralization. It just depends on what you're interested in uh, figuring out. So are you, do you want to look at the number of links to each node or are you interested in uh, the number of shortest paths to each node? Um, so do we have you know, highly interconnected or do we have a more brokering system with clusters? Um, so now let's talk about the data that we're using. Again, this is really preliminary. We're still in the data processing phase. So everyone bear with me on these numbers. I'm going to show you numbers, but they're more uh, for the purpose of example uh, than for actual results. But right now our data set uh, for Earth, we're using a set of igneous rocks uh, developed by uh, Johansson. Uh, he did an exhaustive uh, petrological investigation of uh, 726 igneous rocks on Earth. So that's what we're using to represent Earth. Um, for Mars, obviously we're using Martian meteorites. Uh, we'd eventually like to be able to use uh, Kemen data, but right now we want to stick to 
um, minerals that are more likely in equilibrium rather than the sedimentary rocks we're looking at in Gale Crater. Uh, and then for the moon, obviously we're using the Apollo samples, and for Vesta we have the HD meteorites. So this is our data set. And uh, I'll go ahead and show you guys a network. This is the igneous diagram. Um, so these are the igneous uh, minerals collected by Johansson. And uh, you'll notice here all the, the nodes are colored, right? Um, they're colored according to a really simple scheme that, that uh, we came up with here. So quartz and feldspar in red, and metals are in green, and so on. Um, you, you could color these nodes on many different parameters. You could also um, change the size, uh, you could change the shape of the nodes. You could change uh, the transparency of the nodes. You can represent a lot of different types of information in this, in this diagram. Um, so say I wanted to look at a slightly different uh, chemistry, I could do the Dana classification, that's what we're seeing here, uh, which is a chemical classification essentially, and we'll see that there's a lot of, sil oops, a lot of silicates uh, in these purple ones and the igneous rocks on Earth, which is what we would expect. And um, another important thing to point out is the node uh, diameter, so that's scaled in proportion to the frequency of occurrence. Uh, and also the lengths of the link between those nodes is scaled inversely proportional to the frequency of co-occurrence. So essentially, if two minerals uh, have a short link, if they're close together, they occur together frequently. If they are far apart, uh, they occur together less frequently. If they don't have a link, they don't occur together, <coughs> period. Um, so we've chosen to, to represent it in this way, but um, you could use basically any parameter that you have in, in your data uh, to color or size or shape this network. So now let's have a look at the, again, very preliminary networks of the planetary materials. So here we have Mars, Moon, and Vesta. So here we can just look at their different topologies. We can see there are some similarities to the igneous diagrams, but there are also some differences. Um, for Mars, we see we have a lot of these uh, small uh, nodes, which means they don't occur very frequently, out here around the periphery, um, whereas here in Vesta, you know, everything is pretty well connected. So, but we don't have to just look at their topologies, which we can get a lot of information out of that, right? We can see visually see trends, uh, we can see multi-dimensional data that we wouldn't really be able to recognize in XY plots or in just looking at columns and diagrams, but we can also evaluate the relationships of this multi-dimensional data. And so here are all the metrics uh, that I discussed earlier. So first, let's look at, at density. Um, again, this is preliminary data, so no one take this as truth. This is for the purpose of example. Um, <clears throat> so for density, I said that that's a sort of a proxy for whether or not these uh, minerals are in equilibrium. And so here we can see uh, we're definitely getting into you know, much more equilibrium conditions here with these. Uh, Mars is, is much lower for the data set that we're using. Um, is the caveat there, but that's what you can take away from density, is how in equilibrium are these mineral phases. Uh, diameter is pretty similar across the board for all of these samples, but you'll notice that Mars has a higher, a distinctly higher average network diameter, so it has distinctly higher average uh, degrees of separation, which uh, along with the centralization measures, which are higher than all of the other samples, it tells us uh, that there are a few really important key nodes in the Mars network that are connecting it to other minerals. So, the last technique um, I'd like to point out is uh, cluster analysis. So we use some of these uh, metrics that we just developed to actually cluster uh, the minerals into distinct groups. Uh, you can choose which parameters you cluster these on, you can do it based on chemistry, you can do it based on age, you can do it on, on many things, and you can do it multiple parameters at one time. Um, so our wonderful colleagues at RPI have many different techniques for doing this. Um, the two I'd like to mention are the walk trap method, which you see here, um, which is essentially determining what is clustered with what, seeing if there are clusters and trends in your data that you weren't able to see um, visually. So, great. Um, so in conclusion, applying network analysis and uh, other big data techniques to large mineralogical data sets allows us to analyze mineral relationships and to visualize mineralogical trends. And uh, now we're coming up to the end, and I want to, um, I'm gonna show you guys a little video. Um, so here we're looking at, oh, not yet. Um, here we're looking at uh, the, this is the igneous diagram that I showed you in the first place. So these are the igneous minerals on Earth from Johansson, um, colored with our very basic scheme here. And um, 
And you're going to see me actually playing with a number, which is really fun. I will admit this is a little bit gratuitous at this point, so just fun to play with. But um, what we're going, what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to plot the Mars uh, Moon and Vesta data directly onto the igneous diagram. Um, so this is an idea we're just recently exploring, like in the past week, of a way to show Mars or the Moon and Vesta in context of the igneous minerals that we have on Earth. So go ahead and play it. And so you'll see we can just select and show. And this is really cool. When you, so, so this is what Bob was talking about when he was saying uh, you can actually manipulate the network. And when you let it go, it tries to find its, uh, its equilibrium position, at least energetic state. So with that, I'll finish. We'll just let this loop and play in the background. Um, yeah, feel free to take photos of it or whatever, and also if you're interested in, in seeing more of this, I have some live examples on my laptop. <laughs> 